Somebody came to me with the idea of a television project on the lives of some of the remarkable people I had met as a foreign correspondent. And uh, I toyed with that idea for quite a while, couldn't really find anybody willing to go ahead with the production. And then another friend said, well, why don't you produce it as a book? So I thought, well, that's a great way to get started. And if television comes on sooner or later, we'll do it on television. I wanted people who were alive in the second half of the 20th century, people whom I had either met already and interviewed or would have a reasonable chance of doing so in their lifetime, people who were well enough known to be internationally famous figures, uh, people whose attainment had been recognized in a measurable way. For example, four of the six have Nobel Prizes, uh, the other two Billy Graham and Pope John Paul don't really need them in terms of recognition. And I wanted the people to have qualities that were identifiable for most of their lives that had really impacted the world around them in a way that we could almost measure. Well, they had published a novel of mine that I wrote uh, and published back in 1993, which was not a religious novel at all. It was a perfectly ordinary sort of secular type thriller. But I'd had some contact with them. I had met some of their uh, publications officials. And I sensed that they were interested in spreading beyond the merely sort of religious uh, readership that they often focus on. And they were very interested in the project. And I thought, well, that's a good sign. I'll go with them. I started with him not uh, for any particular reason uh, in terms of importance. They're all equally important in my view. But I thought the people reading the book would, would probably want to begin with somebody they were fairly familiar with. Um, and the reason I selected him was throughout his life, he has focused on the concept of salvation. Of course, he does it from a Christian point of view. But the issue with him was not so much the actual message that he preached, although I feel it's very important, but the way he had lived his life in doing so that he had somehow, to an amazing degree, avoided the usual traps of success in our century, uh, what the old preachers used to call gold, gals, and glory. Uh, he had remained and has remained throughout his life remarkably humble, um, somebody with very firm financial accountability and uh, a morally pure life. The second one, Nelson Mandela. Um, he was a man I did not originally choose, but somebody suggested, me to, suggested him to me. And the more I read about him, the more I got into his autobiography, I realized this was an extraordinary individual whose life has really been characterized in his most famous period by the quality of forgiveness. 27 years in a South African white regime prison comes out and has such a moral authority and dignity and quality of forgiveness that even his white jailers are converted. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Nobel Prize winner of literature, 1974. The man whom I quote at the beginning of the chapter, one word of truth shall outweigh the whole world. Here was a person whose writing, whose resistance to the tyranny of the regime he was brought up in, contributed significantly to the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union, and I think has made him a world-famous figure ever since. Mother Teresa, beloved lady of, of Albanian background, born in Macedonia, who has epitomized for the 20th century the quality of compassion, one human being's extraordinary outreach of love to the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, as she chose. John Paul II, a man who I think will be considered probably one of the greatest popes of all time, not largely because of his identifiable Catholic qualities, but because he has focused throughout his life on human dignity and has done incredible th things to bring about reconciliation with some of the people the Catholic Church did not originally embrace. Elie Wiesel, Nobel Prize winner for peace in 1986, survivor of Buchenwald and Auschwitz concentration camps, and a man whose writing and speaking has focused upon the remembrance of the evil in the human past.
hopefully as a way to guard against repetition in the future. I met four of them and interviewed extensively three of them. The ones I have not met are Pope John Paul and um, Nelson Mandela. Probably the most time with Billy Graham, although the most actual interviews with Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I had three interviews with Solzhenitsyn over a well, really, the course of five years. He was born in 1918, so he's coming up to his 80th year. He's 79 right now, as is Mandela, as is Billy Graham. He lives in Moscow. He has uh, an apartment, and he also has a country house just outside the city where he does most of his writing. Well, that's a good question, Brian. I, I don't know what the sales figures are, but it's safe to say that his Gulag Archipelago, the most famous of his writings about the Soviet labor camp system, uh, has been translated into dozens of languages and must have sold several million copies. And then there are his novels, First Circle, Cancer Ward, and his original book, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which also collectively have sold millions. I first met him in 1989 when uh, he was coming up with his re-edition of August 1914, the novel about the origins of World War I. And, uh, well, not just the origins, uh, the, the beginnings of World War I. And Farrar Strauss, the publishers, said um, to him, we think it's a good idea if you have an interview with a major publication. Would you prefer to go to the New York Times or Time magazine? And uh, he said, Time magazine. And I happened to be in the bureau of Time in Washington, spoke fluent enough Russian to do the interview in Russian, and uh, was asked by the bureau chief to go and do it. He was up in his house, his estate in Cavendish, Vermont, which is uh, an idyllic environment for a writer, uh, about 100 acres with an absolutely uninterrupted view of Vermont hills and birch trees. And the citizens of Cavendish had that marvelous uh, Vermont attitude that they protect their own and they keep, they keep outsiders out. There was a sign, even when I went in 1989, on the, uh, the poster board of the general store, which said, uh, uh, no bare feet, uh, no restrooms, and no directions to the Solzhenitsyns. So they looked after him, and he, was, um, he expressed his gratitude to the uh, townsfolk when he left in 1994. Well, I think the most remarkable aspect of Solzhenitsyn's life is the way he confronted one individual. Of course, he did have a number of helpers, but one individual writer. The full power of the Soviet regime, more or less at the height of its global uh, strength, between, I suppose, uh, 1965, 66, when he really began to fall out of favor, and the time he was forcibly exiled 10 years later, he absolutely refused to be silenced. He kept on writing, he kept on publishing, usually, well, actually entirely overseas. He kept on refusing to compromise on the principles he felt the regime had violated since its inception. And in that way, he showed how one person can resist ty tyranny uh, and not only prevail, but actually cause the tyranny to change. You know, I was surprised, Brian. I had an image in my mind, as I think most people do when they think of Solzhenitsyn, as a rather stern, sort of Old Testament biblical prophet type. And of course, he had the beard to uh, contribute to that sense. But he bounded out of his house when I arrived with my photographer. Uh, in the spring of 1989, with a radiant smile on his face, full of energy, great humor, very gracious, um, a very witty and interesting conversationalist, and a man who, one-on-one, -on -one, could not have been more delightful to talk to. So the opposite, perhaps, of some of the pictures of him that have kind of grown up over the years. He lived from 1976 until 1994 in Vermont. He came to Vermont after a couple of years initially in exile in Zurich, Switzerland. As you remember, he was forcibly thrown out of the Soviet Union in 1974. He was eight years total in the Gulag, but it wasn't all in the sort of Siberian salt mine kind of version, which is famous in his novel, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. What saved his life was he had put in one of the application forms you fill out in jail, hundreds of them, I suppose, nuclear physicist, because he'd read 
a Russian translation of the American nuclear project of 1945. And that aroused enough interest that they sidelined him away from the standard hard labor prisoners into something the Russians called a sharashka, which was sort of a gilded cage where they siphoned off from the prison population top qualified scientists and had them work on important national science projects under conditions of, of relative comfort. Um, so he was closeted in a relatively comfortable place with enough food to eat, with the most brilliant intellectual minds and total freedom to discuss anything because they were already in prison. And that really began the process of education that I think turned him from being a convinced Marxist-Leninist to a, a profound anti-communist at the end of his life. The, the definition of, of uh, great soul, as I've described it, is someone of preeminent attainment who has one or more character qualities of, of outstanding greatness. And um, moral, because these are people who chose certain courses of action when they were faced with multiple things they could have done. Solzhenitsyn could have become embittered, angry, and just given up. But he struggled on, wrote his books, resisted the regime, and won out. Mandela could have become a fierce, embittered, anti-white black nationalist. He was 27 years in prison. But he learned the capacity to forgive, which is to say to the jailer, you know, you're really no different from me. And I'm going to show in the way I live my life and my attitudes that the things I live by are superior to the things you live by. And that's what he did. And that's why the white regime eventually said, if we're going to change without total mayhem, we have to turn to this man. He was a man who, his view of marriage, he got married very young uh, in, uh, in when I think he was 20 uh, in uh, 1938, or maybe it was a year later. And his idea of a wife was somebody with whom he could have uh, a stimulating intellectual conversation and obviously the affection that is normal in married life, but who would not interfere with his career as a great Russian writer. She wanted... Um, you know, uh, things that a lot of women want, which was a, a cozy relationship, an ever-present daddy who uh, plays soccer with the kids and uh, takes her out to the theater and, uh, and to restaurants, and was basically around. Well, what happened in the marriage, of course, he was imprisoned. She was under tremendous pressure while he was in prison, not to reveal who her husband was or where he was. It would have caused her the loss of her job. And they grew apart when they were in prison. Um, she began to live with another man, and the marriage broke up. And uh, for a, a period of time, I think Solzhenitsyn was, was sort of very lonely after he came out of prison and started writing. But then he met this extraordinary woman, his present wife, um, uh, Natalia Dmitrievna, who, uh, when he met her, was a 28-year-old glamorous but brilliant mathematician. And she became his life partner in every conceivable sense that he'd ever hoped for from the beginning, and it turned into a very happy marriage. They were, he was separated from his first wife. They were living in completely different places. And he was so immersed in the, uh, the what you might call the writing of, of the books that caused his eventual um, expulsion from the Soviet Union, that he had this army of helpers, and Natalia Dmitrievna, who became his wife, uh, really became a close confidant and worker, and eventually um, they were living together before um, the marriage to his previous wife was formally terminated. The most controversial speech he gave was the famous Harvard commencement address in 1978, called A World Split Apart. And it annoyed an awful lot of people because he attacked a lot of things in the American media that people today attack. He, he attacked the superficiality, the sort of conventional wisdom that he felt pervaded so many topics under discussion, the obsession with novelty for novelty's sake, sensationalism. And he made the point that one of the reasons this happens is that uh, in a free society, some peop sometimes people uh, 
interpret freedom as license and they go overboard in terms of what they do. By contrast, he said, people who live in highly regimented societies are really more interesting, they're more disciplined, they're more wholesome. And uh, most of the American mainstream journalists in this country were very unhappy with that speech and it seemed to confirm to them their impression that this was a cranky old exile who really didn't understand America and we would tolerate him, but he wasn't the sort of guy we'd really like to identify with. You know, it's a fascinating thing, Brian. He said to people after coming out of Russia in 1974, I am convinced that one day I will go back with my books and my reputation, which meant, in effect, for that to happen, communism would have to go. And he told others, communism is going to collapse. And everybody said, this is crazy. I mean, this is the, with the great Soviet Union, a global empire of tremendous military power, no sign of any cracks in the facade. But he was right, and he always wanted to go back because he felt his Russianness, his identity with the soil, the culture of Mother Russia, an integral part of his life and identity as a writer. And although he wrote very successfully out of Russia, he longed to be part of the milieu from which he had grown, and so he had to go back. He did it every two weeks, and it didn't last very long. Um, I think it's fair to say that that he tended to use the show as a forum for enunciating his own ideas rather than as, as you are graciously doing sitting here and talking about other people's ideas. And added to which, I think there were strong political pressures. Um, some of the th people he had on the show were criticizing the regime. I don't think the Yeltsin government was very comfortable with that and they yanked it. To read the Gulag Archipelago today, I mean, it's still a powerful living book because it's the encounter of a brilliant mind with a great sardonic sense of humor, insatiable curiosity into one of the most mysterious and, in a way, wicked phenomena of our era that the Soviet labor camp system and the system of the persecution of dissidents and so forth. And it's one man's encounter with this system, his incredible memory of details that people told him, bringing it to life with a, with a vivid writing style. So I would, you know, I would say that's a great book, as is One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Very brief uh, summary of a typical day in the life, it's a novel, of a peasant in a labor camp and how he survives and the little details of life that he manages to to uh, be victorious in in order to make that day just a little bit more livable than, than other days. Yeah, it's a very interesting concept. Um, Graham was a young, vibrant evangelist uh, beginning really in the, just at the end of World War II with Youth for Christ. Um, he was a dynamic speaker and the team of young men who were co-evangelists with him got together one day in Modesto, California in 1949 and they said, look, we're having some success. People are coming to the Crusades and as far as we can tell, they're responding to our message. But what is it that has been the downfall of previous evangelists really for the last century? And of course, the, the topics would always come up. Many of them had gotten to uh, improper relationships with women. Many of them had been less than honest about finances. And many of them had grossly exaggerated the effect of their preaching. So they decided in Modesto, California, to come up with something that became known as the Modesto Manifesto, if you like. Each of them covenanted with the others that during his lifetime, uh, as far as finances go, they would never take money from any of the local committees in the cities that they went as visiting preachers, that the local committee would be responsible for all the collection and all the bill paying, and they would only take salaries from their central organization subject to approval by a board. They would always take police estimates of crowds even if they were far smaller than the number of people they thought they had, rather than estimate we had 80,000 people. And finally, and I think most dramatically, each pledged that during his lifetime, he would never be alone in a room with a woman who was not his wife, uh, unless the door were open or somebody else were in the room with him. And that way, even traveling in a car, would, would have to travel with a third person.
That way, Graham, to an amazing degree, has never been spotted with the sort of suspicion of hypocrisy or wrongdoing that unfortunately has, has attached itself to other preachers. There, is, there was one exception, except it was a, a room filled with people. It was a restaurant, and it was Arkansas, and the lady was Hillary Clinton. And they sat at a table in the middle of the room. This was in 1983, when Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas. And of course, Graham, to his great credit, has never confided personal conversations with people uh, while they're alive, at any rate. And he has not revealed what took place at this conversation, but that's the one exception. Graham made a big mistake, as he's the first to admit, in seeing uh, Truman. It was early on in his career, I think it was 1948, and he and uh, two teammates went into the White House dressed in jazzy uh, white suits, pastel ties, and uh, they met with Truman, who was gracious to them, and I think Graham or somebody said while they were in the meeting, can we pray? And they probably prayed a generic prayer for the president's safety and wisdom and so forth. Then they came out onto the White House lawn and the media was there and they said, well, how did it go and what, what happened? Well, said Graham, we prayed. Well, the photographer said, show us how you prayed. So they all got down on one knee and the picture appeared in the papers, infuriating Truman. Uh, because he thought they had basically used him to advance their own agenda, uh, which they hadn't intended to, but that's the way it looked. I first met Billy Graham in uh, person in 1975. That was the first interview I did. I was a, uh, quite a young correspondent in Hong Kong, and he was conducting a Hong Kong crusade. And uh, I thought, well, this is a well-known figure, he's in an interesting part of the world, and I interviewed him in connection with the crusade. Uh, he clearly didn't say anything that the editors of my magazine thought particularly noteworthy. I only got a tiny little box in the people section. I interviewed him at full length again in uh, 1990, um, when President Bush was the president, and that was down in, uh, in uh, North Carolina at his home. I had been to his home in uh, 1987 and 88. I think it was actually just once in 1987, and had met him and talked with him and his wife in 87 and 1988 in different places, uh, discussing some aspects of his forthcoming to visit to China, which he finally conducted in 1988. So I, I did get to know the family a little bit, uh, in, in a personal way. I have not seen evidence of that in public appearances of him recently, but he is a worrier, and the people who've worked with him and know him well describe him as someone who, who tends to get agitated at how things are going to work out, who's going to be there, who's not going to be there, and so forth. And biting nails is, is a, 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 a manifestation of worrying. Oh, yes, because those... Uh, those figures are uh, available for public scrutiny, the tax returns and so forth of, uh, of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And the board of people who have presided over that association um, have never once been taken to task for the slightest suspicion of uh, uh, concealment of funding and so forth. Graham is one of these extraordinary people and when everybody I've met who's ever met him has come away with the same impression, who makes you feel when you sit down with him that, that he's delighted to meet you, that, that you're one of the most interesting people, and he's not playing games. It's a genuine curiosity about people, uh, whether it's some local newspaper reporter or whether it's, uh, you know, the emperor of Japan. And the quality of both being a sort of you know, a grown-up version of a naive North Carolina country boy, and yet somebody who clearly has moved with perfect comfort amongst the most famous people of our century, Winston Churchill and onward, has made him a combination of a warm, homely person to be around, and yet somebody who is not awed by power. And Graham never went in, as far as I know, to any of these presidents and said, you know, this isn't right, you've got to change this or do that. Um, to my knowledge, although, of course, I don't know at all the conversations he had with the different presidents, the only time when he uh, 
fairly strongly agreed, disagreed in private, was with President Clinton over the issue of, of uh, partial birth abortion. But even with President Clinton, he showed um, a degree of uh, graciousness and, uh, well, forgiveness, if you like, that has raised eyebrows amongst some of his own colleagues uh, who are men of the cloth. But he was deeply personable with, with Lyndon Johnson. He used to kneel on the floor of the bedroom in the White House, and Johnson poured out his heart to God, and Graham listened and, and encouraged him. And he's done that with all the presidents, regardless of which political party they've come from. No, uh, we're in a peculiar pos position, Brian. We, we did the um, interview with Solzhenitsyn a couple of years ago with a full camera crew. Uh, but the producer who had backed it at that time later decided he was uncomfortable with the finances going ahead, so it's in limbo at this point. Although we are, I'm making plans to kind of get it off dead center now that the book is out. Well, I don't know. It depends who, which uh, distribution company or which agency decides that they want to back it. Um, I mean, I think if you can still get to these people, the ones who are alive and still alert enough, for, for really good interviews. Uh, it would be a, a fascinating project to, to see interviews with them and at the same time splice, uh, splice in uh, file footage of what they have done and where they've been in different parts of their life. When I was an undergraduate at, at Oxford, uh, as a complete amateur, I enjoyed acting. And uh, the college I was at, Worcester College, had quite a strong drama program. Well, not a program because it wasn't, wasn't a course, but a, a, amateurs who in their spare time would act and I acted in a few of the college plays and the organizers of my local college dramatic society were well plugged into the main Oxford group uh, called OUDS, Oxford University Dramatic Society, one of whose leading lights at that time was Michael York. Subsequently uh, he, he was called Michael Johnson at that time and uh, a director did a very nice production of Romeo and Juliet in which I had a fairly small part as Tybalt and Michael York was Romeo and we we started off uh, acting in a wonderful open-air theater in Cornwall England uh, like a sort of Roman amphitheater and then one of our uh, group had arranged uh, a tour of Israel and this was back in uh, 1963 so uh, it was it was quite an exciting experience I I only met uh, Elie Wiesel and I in fact did not formally interview him um, in the late 1980s when I was, 1988 in fact, when I was uh, a full-time journalist in Washington and working to uh, try and help get um, uh, Terry Anderson out of captivity in uh, Lebanon where he was held. And there were a number of events sponsored by the, co-sponsored by the uh, Journalist Committee to free Terry Anderson in which I was involved. And Elie Wiesel, to his tremendous uh, credit showed up and sort of lent his own moral force to freeing the hostages. 23 altogether, I left in 1994. I had been around a long time and I'd been back in Washington 10 years and there, there wasn't really the sort of things that I, I enjoyed doing uh, sitting on our doorstep. I mean, covering the State Department was, was interesting up to a point, but I found myself, um, I don't think as engaged as one should be in this town. Uh, if you're not engaged very long, they'll find somebody who's more engaged. And I, I had already started writing books, and I thought, well, now is the time to make, I hope, a gracious exit and do something different. Four uh, by, by myself, and I've been co-author of, of three others. I didn't go to the American Spectator because I said, gee, I want to find a, you know, a really conservative outfit to write for. I wanted to write for somebody who would basically let me write about foreign policy in a way that I had been doing at Time magazine without a whole lot of interference. Uh, from a relatively conservative point of view, but, but not from a partisan point of view. And uh, with few exceptions, everything I write about in the American Spectator has been foreign affairs or foreign policy. Um, and I did one story comparing Blair and Clinton uh, in terms of their Christian faith acknowledgement, but uh, I don't get involved very much in the sort of uh, some of the main projects they're involved with. I was born in, uh, in England, uh, um, just south of London, uh, uh, actually on D-Day, which I guess gives away 
when I was born. And uh, in a, a part of England that became known as Doodlebug Alley, the German V-1 uh, ramjet bombs were flying overhead and it was becoming a fairly risky place to be. So my family moved us all out to the north of England. I joined a British overseas bank and uh, they sent me to New York. And I thought, well, if banking is going to be interesting anywhere, at least for me, it should be interesting in New York. And uh, um, the work I was doing in the bank was, to, to my mind, extraordinarily boring and unchallenging. And somebody suggested going to graduate school. And I leapt at the opportunity and was five years at the University of Washington in Seattle. She's a Filipina. Um, I met her when I was based in Hong Kong covering the Philippines. And my first trip over, I was introduced to her by the girlfriend of, um, of uh, somebody who eventually became uh, White House uh, press photographer. So uh, it, was, uh, it was an interesting connection. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I, I went into Albania in 1990. Uh, I still had a British passport then. I hadn't been naturalized. And uh, I didn't lie on my, on my application. I said I was a a teacher, which I do. I do some teaching in spare time. And uh, I went in with a British tourist group. And Albania was still this sort of weird uh, kind of utopian paradise uh, with, with a sort of worship of the leader and total isolation from the rest of the world, a sort of European version of North Korea. I thought there was something about his life, something about his writing that indicated a sense of commitment to a moral vision that was rare in any human being. And the more I looked into the things he had done since he became prominent uh, in the late 50s with his incredible book, Night, the more I realized what an admirable person he was and is. Night is, again, rather like One Day in the Life of Ivan, Ivan Denisovich, a very short novel, but deeply biographical, describing uh, his first encounter with Auschwitz uh, concentration camp in 1944. And uh, he lost his fa father when uh, the Nazis evacuated Auschwitz inmates and told them to march to Buchenwald. And it's, it's the incredible view of what this I mean, to use the word nightmare, it's almost a cliche. What with this uh, phantasmagoria of human evil was like through the eyes of a 15-year-old and the sort of pathos of somebody who was not entirely a child only and yet not, not yet an adult. It's an incredibly powerful book. He lives in New York City, and while well, he commutes, he also teaches up at Boston University, and he travels a very great deal. Uh, as you know, he was... Um, very critical of uh, the policy of the administration and indeed of Western governments in general uh, when Bosnia was being pummeled to bits by the Serb nationalists in 1992-1993. Uh, so he's all over the place trying to address issues where you have the threat of genocide taking place. It's a good, it's a, it's a good question, Brian, because one of the points I make about the characters in, these, in this book is maybe we can talk about this a little later, is the notion that each of them seems to come to at some point that it's almost as though they have a calling. Well, in the case of Billy Graham, of course, and, and the Pope and Mother Teresa, uh, they identify this very much in the Christian sense of a divine calling. But in Elie Wiesel's case, he was a um, very talented journalist, actually a foreign correspondent. He was the correspondent for Yediot Achronot in New York, um, traveled frequently to Israel. But he was coming to a point where his traditional Jewish religious faith was becoming somewhat frayed. He went to synagogue rather infrequently. He really didn't identify with the kind of search for God that he had experienced as a young man, as a youth, a very devout Jew from a family of Hasidic background. He was born in Romania, uh, although later it was transferred by the Nazis to, to Hungary, and now it's back in Romania, Transylvania, in a small Jewish town, uh, Shtetl, as they became known. Well, what happened when the, when the accident took place? Of course, he was completely incapacitated. He was in hospital. In, amazing things were going on in the world. The, the Suez crisis was taking place in the Middle East. The Russians were invading uh, Budapest in Hungary. 
And he was forced, I think, to re-examine what he was doing with his life, what his priorities were, what he wanted to focus on. And it was shortly after that that he had this amazing, uh, well, the, the encounter with uh, François Mauriac, the French uh, Nobel Prize winner, led to the publication of Night in France in 1958. And that really set him on this pathway of global recognition as a voice of calling the human race and calling the Jewish people to remembrance of evil in the past as a protection against repeating it in the future. No, not formally. It's, a, it's an odd situation. I called him up a few times and we had it all set up. Um, and then he was traveling and then I was traveling and the book needed to get done. So uh, I decided I would simply go ahead with what I had and uh, write the book anyway uh, without a formal invitation, a formal interview. There was a, a lot of very good biographical and journalistic material on him. There were videos, there were interviews, taped interviews. Um, uh, I read a great deal of his writings on various topics and I talked to a number of people who, who knew him quite well. So it wasn't difficult uh, any more than it was with the Pope to get a fairly good flavor of him. And I had actually met him, so um, I had a certain feel for, for the personality of the man. I met her and interviewed her for the first time uh, in 1975, actually the same year I met Billy Graham. And I was in Delhi covering Indian politics. And of course, she was very well known even then. And I thought, I can't be in Delhi if this lady's here without trying at least to get to meet her. And, she uh, happened to be free, and I went along with a colleague from the Time Bureau in Delhi. And the interview with her was, was quite as striking as you would imagine an interview like that to be. I, I had no agenda. I, I wasn't, in fact, commissioned by the magazine to do anything on her. And uh, she was every bit as intense and yet non-judgmental on one in a one-on-one -on -one encounter as you would imagine somebody like that to be. I think um, Hitchens in his book, The Missionary Position, he's a, a, a very talented writer, writes for, for Vanity Fair, and he wrote an absolutely vitriolic attack upon her, which I think in many ways was more an attack upon the Christian faith. He acknowledges himself as a very, uh, uh, very, well, I don't know what word he'd use, but I would say an ardent atheist. And um, one of the ways I think he sought to express his non-belief was to find or to seek, uh, search for uh, points of weakness in her career, as though to say, look, here's the, the emblem of Christian love and look how flawed she is. And what he discovered indeed were areas, I think, where she didn't exhibit very good judgment. I mean, she she would take money from people, whoever they were, if they wanted to help the work, without sort of spending much time thinking about their background or how they came to the money. So here she was taking money from the Duvaliers, uh, that's right, Charles Keating, and uh, no doubt other people we, we might not think very highly of. Um, but I think part of it was absolute naivety. I mean, she just, she was, in political terms, I would say almost completely tone deaf. She went to South Africa, and apparently she did not know of apartheid. Well, apparently had never heard of it. This was, I think, relatively recently, uh, the early 1990s or maybe the late 1980s, um, when Indira Gandhi proclaimed emergency rule in 1975 and jailed a lot of journalists and instituted a policy of forced uh, sterilization on many Indian mothers, um, she thought, well, you know, crime is down and maybe this is doing something good for the country. Again, I don't think that was a very perceptive awareness of the realities of Indian life. And yet, look who she was, look what she did. So my point in this book is none of these people, even Mother Teresa, is flawless. Um, all of them have made mistakes, but all of them, as I say in the introduction, even when they've crossed the line that separates um, querulousness from skepticism or pride from self-confidence, have come back and have corrected themselves and in most cases publi publicly acknowledged their errors. That's a good question. I think 
he will emerge as one of the greatest Christian leaders of all time, and I'm not a Roman Catholic when I say that, in that he has focused his attention on the most important issues facing the whole of the human race, regardless of religious background, issues like poverty, like capitalism, like war, like peace, like justice, um, like human life questions, euthanasia and abortion. And he has addressed those issues in a very dramatic, very immediate way, founded and based upon his own Christian faith, but in a way that ordinary people of many backgrounds have somehow been able to identify with and sometimes even agree with. And he's done it in a manner that also constantly points to reconciliation with people of different backgrounds. I mean, no other pope has gone so far to apologize for what the Roman Catholic Church historically did to the Jewish people. And no other pope in personal terms has gone so far uh, in the process of reconciliation with Jewish people from a Christian perspective. That's true. They felt that the, the Vatican was still in its recent, um, very long prepared document on the Vatican and the Holocaust had uh, still somehow protected Pope Pius XII from charges that many Jewish people have leveled at him, that he was silent when he could have spoken out, he could have done more. Um, but in terms of acknowledging the historical legacy of anti-Semitism, I think this pope has been more open and more honest uh, than any Catholic figure in history. He has changed the direction of the Roman Catholic Church. When he came into office in 1978, there was a real crisis of confidence, both on the part of the lay people towards the leadership and on the part of many senior clerics as to what the church represented. And he fairly and squarely squelched the sort of liberation doctrine uh, theology, which said, well, what we really need is, is a Marxism that's dressed up in Christian terminology. And he said, that's not Christian. We're, we're not going to accept that. And at the same time, he did not revert to a sort of archaic spirituality, but he said, these are the issues facing the world, war and peace. He tried to stop the Gulf War from taking place. And I think his legacy will be to impart to the Catholic Church hierarchy for a long time to come a much more vigorous sense of, of doctrinal, um, if you like, orthodoxy, uh, and a, a much more vigorous sense of involvement, indeed, in political affairs around the world. If you look at the number of Roman Catholic figures who've assumed, in many cases, heroic roles in the democratization of their societies, it's quite impressive. I would describe myself as a Christian. I happen to be of, of Protestant background. I, I used to be an atheist, so my Christianity came through a, a personal experience of conversion many years ago. And uh, I find myself comfortable with uh, uh, Christians of many different confessions, even if I disagree with them theologically. I, I was a militant atheist uh, as an undergraduate, and I used to argue with a, a very gentle Anglican clergyman trying to persuade him to be an atheist, and uh, he wasn't very impressed with that. Um, but he was very gracious, and he would never argue back. He would always agree with me, and I was kind of frustrated. And one day after I'd graduated from college, he was in his study just saying, may I read some passages from Scripture? And I said, well, I'm safe here. He's not going to preach at me. And he read some of the passages from the Gospels where Jesus is talking very intimately to his disciples, like, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And I'd heard this stuff before. But somehow, at that point, it seemed as though Jesus was alive and he was real to me in a way that I could no more deny than I could deny the existence of my parents. And I knew something had changed within me, and uh, I never looked back. More than you think, Brian, I have bumped into a number of Christian believers, both Catholic and Protestant, in many different parts of the world. In fact, one of the things I've been doing recently is to try and set up a global network of these people. And these are top-flight journalists, many of them, who I won't name names because, you know, they may not want to be publicly known, but people with first-rate jobs in 
serious mainstream organizations. And they don't preach to anybody, they don't proselytize, they just do their job in a wonderfully professional way and their lives reflect uh, the quality of the faith they have. No, I haven't. Um, I had a long tussle with the South African Embassy in Washington trying to get to him fairly early on in the book and I had all kinds of good connections in South Africa but he uh, he's very closely protected from the media by a sort of phalange of, uh, phalanx, I should say, of, of uh, uh, press assistance. And so I didn't get to him in time to do the book. Um, but I did get down to South Africa. I, I looked at Robben Island from a boat bobbing offshore. That was 1997 I was in South Africa. Yes, now you can get there. You couldn't then. You couldn't land on it. 27. A man of immense personal dignity, more and more of the accounts you read and you hear from people who have met him reflect a sort of gentle, a gentlemanliness, almost an old-fashioned Victorian courtliness about him, which I think derives not only from the fact that he came from a chieftain's family, but that he profoundly respects the human quality in every human being and he rises to to meet you when you walk into a room um, a man of uh, great humility and a man who has translated his experience of suffering into a profound wisdom uh, not infallible of course there are certain things I would certainly disagree with in his conduct of the government since he became president but as far as reconciliation goes I know of no political figure in the 20th century who has displayed the kind of graciousness towards um, a formerly fiercely adversarial foe than he has done since being in office. I think I really started writing uh, and researching in 1995 and I did my really uh, serious solid writing uh, during 1996 and 1997. Muggeridge is, is of course, he's been dead a few years now, but he was had a wonderfully um, incisive insight into why certain things were important and other things were not. And in no better way did he demonstrate this than describing Solzhenitsyn as one of the great, you know, one of the greatest men alive in that time. But as far as books go, um, there are many excellent biographies of. Uh, of all of the people. I think one of the most impressive books is Mandela's autobiography, uh, The Long Walk to Freedom, which is a very powerful book describing his experience of, of the hostility and rage of his jailers and how he dealt with that. There are some good biographies uh, of the Pope and in fact uh, the definitive biography will be out in probably a couple of years by George Weigel um, who has had access to the Pope to an unprecedented degree, plus to all of the people he knew in childhood. I think more than anything else, that came out in the sense of focus these people have had, the preoccupation with not wasting time, with not being trivial, with really zeroing in on what they were called to do. And as I saw the intensity of that focus, I thought, well, I think I ought at least to try to be a little bit more serious about my own work and be a bit more conscious of, of some of the things I've taken for granted previously. There's nothing mystical to me about the words, the, the number six, it could have been seven, it could have been five, but um, the six were characters who I would say would turn up on almost anybody's list. And I, I mentioned in the introduction that uh, some conservatives would not agree to the inclusion of Mandela or perhaps even Wiesel, and some liberals would not be comfortable with Pope John Paul or Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So th there's something for everyone. But um, Aung San Suu Kyi of Burma, Dalai Lama, wonderful people though they are, I'm sure, have not had the global impact for, in the course of their lives that these other people have had. Thank you, Brian.